are here because you, you want to produce poultry. You want to produce poultry. Okay, that's the important part because I'm, I'm kind of not too much into the talking about this anymore. I really want to only visit when we can actually deploy these systems because I am primarily a business developer. I'm not you too much. a lot of trouble to get this mic to Yes, work. okay. Well, is it working? Yeah. yeah, you can hear it anyway. But so this is the thing. Um, chickens to me have been like a, a, a salvation of sorts. Um, probably the reason I'm not a statistic in Guatemala at this point is because of chickens. Uh, we had eggs. We didn't have a lot of other nutrient sources and protein and all of that, but we had eggs. All of my brothers, younger than me, are easily six inches taller because they got protein by the time they started to grow. And all of the ones older than me were all about the same size. And it had nothing to do with genes. It all about food. So chickens to me were like this thing that we, we really learned about. And the one thing that, that, that bothered me about nine years ago is studying in the U.S. about this pasture poultry thing. I don't know if you heard of that pasture poultry. It's like a big buzzword. And realizing that whomever got into that had no idea about chickens. And that's why they started putting them on grasses. Uh, not understanding that there's nothing to, chickens have nothing to do with grasses. So I got into this business because I knew that there was this humongous gap in between what people were trying to do, those who did not want to do confinement poultry or confinement animal, and those folks who were trying to do something different but really didn't have a foundation on where to start. And I realized I did. And I'm an agronomist and I graduated from Guatemala's National Agriculture School and, and I had been practicing agriculture. So I thought, okay, that's an area I got a good idea. So that's how I got into poultry. Yes. I uh, could translate, but, but we only have one hour. Here's what we can do. I can sit down with you and, and go through this again afterwards. If you don't, do everybody understand Spanish? No, okay. How many people here understand uh, just English? <sighs> we kind of have a, an imbalance here. Yeah, no, I'm gonna translate afterwards and I can visit with you. Si quiere platicamos después despacito con usted. Um, pero si, si entiende un poco de inglés, nada, uh, perdón, disculpe. Sí, porque a mí me instruyeron de traer todo en inglés, porque el año pasado lo hicimos en español y se convirtió en un problema. Sí, disculpe. Pero vamos a platicar, no se preocupe, no, no va a quedar abandonada. <laughs> so, anyway, the first thing then, um, to get straight into this stuff, the, the foundation of, of our poultry is on the fact that chickens are jungle fall. And if you start, you can see that easily if you, if you have an indigenous training like I do. And I went to ag school and I learned anything about, anything you wanna know about row crops and chemicals and all of that, I learned it. In fact, my first two months after graduating from ag school, I worked for a German chemical company and with, within two months, I was the best salesman for chemicals in all of the highlands. That it runs in the family. My brother, one of my older brothers was the, um, the best salesman for Pepsi-Cola for 20 years in a row. So we just know how to do that. And, um, but I didn't, I wasn't interested in selling chemicals because uh, I understood way more about agriculture than the agriculture school had taught us. And the science was good but not the logic and not the departing point and not the destinations. So I knew that much. And um, so I went back to recuperating a lot of the native uh, training that I had not quite acquired at that point and then started matching it with the scientific training. And that probably is the biggest advantage today is that finally the world is waking up that we already failed. Uh, the agricultural system conventional already failed and we lost also the knowledge that could save us. And so in the middle of that, you know, thinking from an indigenous perspective is so central to figuring out what we need to do next. And that means, and you know, if, if, if you, you won't be able to see this, so I'm gonna explain it to you. What I have here is a circle, right? 
So most, most of us are, who are trained in agriculture, farmers who are not even trained, they get into a piece of land and then what they think first is, what am I gonna produce here? Right? So maybe cattle, maybe chickens, maybe something else. But everybody starts from the idea of producing something that the market wants to buy and then walk it backwards from there. And that's how we end up really close to the market, very far from nature. And the one thing about, about food is that it's, it's a very simple equation and it's very efficient, can be done very efficiently if you understand just the very simple framework. Food, the food that you put on the table, is simply a lot of chemicals organized into molecules and, and systems that allows you to eat it and can nourish you in biological forms and molecular forms that our bodies can process instead of getting poisoned. Yet, well, some that will poison us, but most of the foods, that's what, what they are. Simply, it's a, new, a different arrangement of energy, which just before was, was in the atmosphere and in the soil and everywhere in an unedible form. All there is, and if you know thermodynamics, you understand that there's two fundamental laws of thermodynamics. The first one is the conservation of energy. Energy cannot be produced, cannot be destroyed, it can only be transformed. And the second one is the laws of entropy. Everything wants to disperse. That's why when we die, we disperse. An animal dies, it disperses. And then there is the competition between entropies which allows us to exist. We are an anomaly of physics, but we are, we are normal in the context that there is this other space where we organize energy and stays organized enough to move through a system and then becomes disorganized again and then goes back and reorganizes. And if you think of it, all of us on Earth are simply energy that existed billions of years ago that has been organized over and over into animals and people and all of that. That's all we are. And food is no different. All it is is a different organization of energy that on this end was unedible. It existed only in the form of the chemical elements in the periodic table and on and on. And minerals in the soil and CO2 in the air and ammonia and all of that. So when you understand that fundamental principle of where food comes from, and then you go back and sit in front of a piece of land and instead of thinking, what can I produce here? You start by thinking, what would be the best way this space can transform unedible energy into edible energy? Just by asking that question, you flip the whole thing on its head. And guess what? Folks who get into a space with the intention of producing something, they're still gonna be managing energy no matter what anyway, because they can't produce anything, nature does it. And so as we start from that perspective, normally we end up spending incredible amounts of time, money, all kinds of resources in the attempt at producing something that may not even want to be produced in that space. We say that we plant most of the stuff that doesn't want to grow, and then everything that wants to grow, we try to kill it. That's a fundamental principle of conventional colonized thinking. And so this circular diagram that I had on here, which is where I concentrate a lot of the energy in, so that we can set the frame properly, all it does is simply put the energy that comes into your poultry production unit in the form of feed, grains, forages, and all of that, and then puts it through a process where, as a result of planting something on the ground, we get to capture free-floating energy. It's turned into forages, not pastures, but mostly broadleaf, high-protein, low-fiber uh, uh, forages, forages that we put on the bottom uh, at the ground level. The poultry then forages on some of that. The, the, the foundational uh, principle of the jungle nature of the chicken gives us a blueprint on which um, we have built a multi-story canopy, a uh, set of canopies above the poultry. So in Minnesota, for example, we use hazelnut and elderberries on the bottom understory. And then above that, we use uh, maple uh, trees, which produce sugar. Um, I don't know if you ever tried maple syrup, but that's where it comes from. Uh, oaks and all kinds of other strata all the way up 30, 40, 60 feet up above the ground. 
And then on the bottom, we put forages, most of them perennial regenerating uh, forages like comfrey and around here other herbs that actually don't get killed by the chickens, that they will continue to regenerate. So in that space, we, we, we divide it into two paddocks so we can rotate the chickens back and forth with no effort of us, I mean of our own. What we do is we build the buildings, uh, and I got the blueprints and all of that if you want to check them out. We got the buildings elongated so that we can create a larger space for the chickens to go out. And so if this table is the building, it will be divided in the middle right here. And then there'll be a paddock on this side and a paddock on that side. And the protocols, we have researched the heck out of this. So we understand now how many square feet we need per chicken on each side so that it allows enough time for the land to regenerate while they are on the other side. And so we can keep moving them back and forth. Above that bottom, bottom you know, ground level food source for the chicken, which is forages and also a lot of sprouted grain. In this case, we're putting all kinds of mixes that gives us a really balanced nutrition for the chicken. And then we put that on the bottom, we sprout it, and then we let chick the chicken lose in that area. And then we do the same and go back and forth. By doing that, we have been able to graze healthy flocks of broilers, which are highly demanding of energy. We have been able to raise them with only 33% ground up feed and 67% just forages and grains. And we raise them to the same weight, better quality, much healthier on the same amount of days. Now that is if you are managing energy. If you want to produce chickens, then you go the traditional way and you put them in a building and then you end up stuck with a really high cost of feed and a lot of work. So that's why we, we, we flipped this, this whole thing on its head and started looking at it from energy transformation. Why? Because in a confinement animal production, you got all the cost, but you got very little benefits. Your energy is just stuck in there. It's not doing anything. By putting them through this system, we now get to feed all of these edible forests. And I can only envision your, your place, for example, with units like this, you know, just the shelter and the paddocks and all of that. And then the poultry, in our case, loads up with nutrition. That's that paddock, the bottom, the soil and the, and the biology at a scale that we didn't recognize until about three years ago when the when researchers um, we, we also was taking the data, right? Uh, you know, um, harvesting the hazelnuts and harvesting the elderberries, measuring the, the, the biomass that was being built. And I was just loading that data into a spreadsheet that these researchers had created for farmers to put information up. And one day I get a call because they wanted, they wanted me to correct whatever I was putting in there because that was wrong. And I, I was just sitting there on my desk and thinking, well, I wonder what they're talking about. I didn't say anything, you know, you're always worried about pissing off some university professor that then starts a campaign against you. Uh, well, they didn't believe that the data was correct from my hazelnuts because I was reporting seven pounds of dry nuts, only 5% empty nuts, and the data from 500 cultivars across the Midwest was at one pound and 33% of that in kernels because they were losing uh, almost 30 to 35% in empty nuts that never, never loaded. While my percentage was 5% empty, theirs was 30 to 35%. And my total production of clean nuts, same variety, same everything, were up to seven pounds, while their production was, in the best case scenarios, was 2.5 pounds. But in average, they were oscillating between one and 1.25 pounds. And, and so they said, no, that you, you took the wrong data. Maybe your scale is wrong, something. So I said, no. I mean, I'm actually a researcher, and I test everything, no? But let me double check, because I still had all these buckets classified and labeled and all of that. So I went back, re teared the bucket, all of the things. I came back with the same data. So I told them, no, that's what it is. So anyway, they spent one full day trying to figure out what was wrong with the data. It couldn't enter their minds that that was the genetic capacity of the plant, which had never been expressed until we gave that forest all that it needed. And so the whole, for 40 years, the University of Minnesota and the University of Wisconsin had been arguing with farmers and, every, and each other about how 
Growing hazelnuts in the Midwest was not feasible because there was not enough productivity per bush and there was not enough uniformity and there were too many problems like empty nuts, empty shell nuts and stuff like that. Well, all of that got fixed. All of it, including the uniformity of the nuts, the amount of nuts per bush, and the loading per nut. And all, all we did was put the chickens under them. So the amount, and, and we know now that fruits don't respond the same way, especially to broilers. So if we're going to do broilers, we're going to have to talk because we don't put fruit trees just randomly uh, above the broilers. With the egg layers, the apples and the and the and the uh, and the um, uh, what do you call the duraznos? Huh? Peaches, anyway, those did well, and wild plums. Uh, we had these white plums in the front of the house. Uh, when we arrived in this place where we live now, they were already there, never seen a wild plum, maybe one or two. And then I put a poultry unit in the front for eggs, and I only had like 50 hens in there. But I put the paddocks, and I already had the rotational thing in mind, so I put the paddocks, rotated in between. And then the next year, we couldn't, the, 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 those plum trees were absolutely overloaded uh, with plums. And now we understand the science behind it, you know, and, and it wasn't that complicated. But the thing is, most of the time, if you are a traditional agronomist, you're going to go to the nutrient supplements and stuff like that and just start buying manganese or you're going to start buying calcium and then modifying that, the, 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 the soil nutrients so that you can get the plants to flower and produce or you get them to develop vegetative material. And all of that is doable with nutrients in the soil. This happened without us intervening. The poultry manure, once we started measuring the nutritional profile, it's got almost everything that these plants needed, but it didn't have, you know, in the case of apples, for example, they didn't, they didn't do very well because the apple needed a different nutritional profile. So we started lining up which species did better with the, um, with the, with the manure. And obviously the, the ones that require more nitrogen will do better because the poultry is not very efficient at processing uh, proteins. And so it absorbs only a certain amount and the rest of it passes it as nitrogen. And so, those like nut trees, that's why they were doing so well. In the case of the hazelnuts, uh, later I learned that they need about upwards of 300 pounds of nitrogen per uh, acre to be able to, to, to uh, load their fruit and all of that, their nuts. And so, so having said all of that, the bottom line was that we encountered a opportunity to, to really capture that full you know, energy transformation cycle, not only from the feed to the chicken and then to eggs or to meat, uh, but rather, you know, moving it forward and then becoming the foundation of a whole uh, edible forest on the outside. And that is where the, the real benefit of our poultry system is, uh, is materialized. It's not because we grow good quality eggs, although the eggs uh, that we grow are, are when you, when, you, when, you, when you crack an egg and into a pan, and normally the eggs you buy in the store, they just splash all over because they got no integrity to, to, the, to the formation. These eggs, you, you, you break them, and they stay as a clump. They are solid, they are dark yellow, they are really, really nutritious. Um, and yeah, that was one of the results of the system. But for example, in Northern Guatemala, and this, this is the same ecology, by the way, all the way down to, to Northern Paten, um, where well, we develop a new system now with a multitude of species and uh, probably have the same species you already have because there's no rocket science to that. Um, but what we found out when we did the, the, the calculations as to the cost of the eggs, we found out that we could actually give away the eggs because of the profits we can generate just by having the chickens under a multi-story uh, forest out there. And if we, put, if we keep the flocks uh, with from around 100 to 150 hens, we actually don't don't need almost any of the feed because you can generate most uh, it's almost sufficient forage, and you can put other kinds of grains enough to actually feed them almost completely with no feed, no ground up feed, except some supplements that we have to bring in, and um, and those supplements are mostly those. It's called um, nucleus nucleo. I don't know if you ever 
mix up your own um, poultry feed, but that's stuff that you buy straight out of the store. And we are using it in less than 10% of the um, total that you would use in a ton of feed. So for example, the nucleus, you would take 2,000 pounds, so we put about 60 pounds of nucleus to get the minerals and the micronutrients and all of that uh, into the feed. Um, we are using about 10% of that amount per ton, but we are putting it in water. And then in the water, we soak the grain and it absorbs the same nutrients and it's more digestible for the chicken if it goes through the grain, then it goes straight into ground up dry feed. So those are basic things that we started tweaking that are incredibly beneficial because if you raise chickens and you raise them traditionally, you will know that up, you know, 60, 60 to 70% of your cost is gonna be feed. And then you are left with a very small margin. Well, this way, we are actually taking out the biggest disadvantage for small growers, which is buying feed. Yes, the corporations and the ministers of agriculture that give away chickens for the purpose of helping their buddies who sell chickens and sell feed, they're not very happy with this because we actually don't need them if in, in places like the northern rainforest of Guatemala. So that's the full circle, energy management. Rather than thinking of production of eggs, we thought of energy management. And that looped up uh, these endless cycles that we can now close. So to give you an idea, this canopy that we are building, I don't know if, how many of you know what a, a pacaya plant is. But pacayas, if you, if you grew up in the forest, you're seeing them, they grow in complete darkness. There is no access to sun, just like shati, um, on the bottom of the forest. Now, pacayas produce, I mean, those are very expensive and, and very rare and, uh, if you want to market them. Um, they also like the chickens, under. They, they don't have any problem. Then the way we knew this is because I grew up in Poptun, where we had more chachalacas that you knew what to do with. And that does just literally a different version of a chicken. It's, it's just a wild one. Um, so the other thing is that above that, you can put many more canopies in the rainforest than you can say in Minnesota. Um, so we went all the way up to the Ramon tree level so that we can also be producing nuts up all the way up and then start to build that strata. Now, if you want to put forest species in there, that's okay. But in other places, you know, um, um, uh, coffee, for example, does really well with the hens, um, bananas, avocados, Orange trees do okay with the hens, and um, a, you name it. If depending on where you are and in what region, we can then populate that forest with the local knowledge and the local experiences. And some places already got that canopy, so it would be very easy to just incorporate that poultry on the bottom and then bring this, this uh, rotational you know, system and all of the forages and all of this regime, uh, feeding regime that we have in place. Um, all right, so. So again, the, uh, the unit is, just to, to cap this, is a building. The building, we calculated four egg layers at one square foot per chicken. The hens, we use two square, foot, square feet per chicken. And in the design of the egg layer, the, the broiler is simply a square building, I mean a rectangular building so that we get to spread them out and then let them out in the two different, in this case, if you're gonna do I calculated 250 broilers per flock. We do 1,500 in Minnesota um, with one uh, and a half to two acres of rotating paddocks. So divide that 0.75 acres on each side, 1,500 broilers, and that probably would work around here unless, unless it doesn't start raining again, <laughs> then you're in trouble. But uh, based on the, most of the regeneration happens if there's water, so precipitation is a very important factor that we use. We modified the system for the dry corridor. In the dry corridor, we are, we are starting to, to, to um, um, well, we haven't built a unit yet. We built a half of a unit in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico, and we learned that agave is central to the poultry system in a dry corridor because of the biomass that we can produce with the agave. And the agave is highly nutritional. In fact, it can eliminate corn and soybeans out of a mix if you got agave. And, he produce, and it's a really uh, good uh, biomass producer. So from an energy transformation standpoint, in a dry corridor, in a dry place, agave is probably as good as it gets. So just like other species would be better in Minnesota or in the rainforest. 
So the building then, you know, again, is, is elongated so that we can divide it. There will be a door on this side, a fence, and a door on the other side, so they can go out there when you want to lock them out on this side. And then to get them out on this side, all you do is close that door and open this one in the morning. Uh, it takes us about 10 minutes a day uh, to take care of all, uh, a, a large flock in the evening and about 30 minutes in the morning to take care of a 1,500 bird flock. And the rest of it is designed so that we don't have to worry about predators and so on. In this region, what I suggest is that we use live barriers because we have uh, no, uh, diurnal um, predators that are very difficult to control, like, like the jaguars and, I mean, what was it that got your chickens? So the ocelot took five of their chickens and they are gonna come out during the day. So during the day, what we need is bi uh, biological barriers is much more effective. There's a fellow, his name is Will Smith, not the actor, but this, this uh, British fellow. And they did this in Africa. They actually restored a, a whole mountain range. It was many, many communities. And they created a large scale wall of China version, wall of China version. Um, around this whole thing because they, in that case, the, 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 the animal that would not let anything grow there was the orangutans. And so, so they, they built this barrier with just, just stuff that they don't cross. In our case, we got pinuelas, we got all kinds of other species that not even the pigs would venture through. Dogs, cats, they don't venture to it because they get ripped up. And they know it, they just go and just keep going and eventually they leave your chickens in peace. From the top, we got the, the, uh, the, the hawks and all of that, and that's what the canopy is there for. A hawk needs a clear line of sight, it needs to zoop down, although we got the gavilanes here, and those suckers, they are different because they just hover and they go drop vertical. That challenge, you can, what we do then is we increase the canopy density so they can't see. Uh, in Minnesota, we don't have those, so we keep the density at around 60%, and that allows us to get enough sun so that there is uh, aeration and all of that. In the rainforest, you don't need that kind of aeration. So you can actually close it further and then the gavilan doesn't stand a chase. That's why they go around in the open space in the prairie anyway. So for every one of those situations, we have that out for the counter, you know, the, the, the counter side of it. But always try to figure out how do we solve in this case, the predators, with something that is also productive because the pinuelas are highly nutritious, they are very marketable, and they can actually be part of an industry. And yet, also, is your life fence, and now you're not spending money on fence materials and posts, and especially, you're not working every day, which is one of the things I'm allergic to. Um, and I wrote that in my book. I mean, I really don't want to work. I did that plenty. I didn't dislike it, but I'm not interested in working. I'm interested on managing energy. And yes, in the process, we work a lot, but in, in, uh, you know, an hour of my labor produces a lot more energy than an hour of somebody who's working to produce things uh, rather than managing energy. So... Could you just repeat the name of that plant? The what? The plant. Oh, the pinuelas? Yeah, and they have some, and they, are, they grow really well in this region. So because we have to be careful with the predators, especially the ground predators at night, because a lot of them are, are going to make their way through, the buildings, we design them with a lot of care for every single inch on the bottom especially. So we don't go to sleep at night and then come out and some critter get in, possum or whatever, and decimated your chickens. We have never lost a chicken to a predator, except at the very, very beginning, the first year, we lost about five to a, a hawk, and we lost like three to a possum, and a, a few more to raccoons. We learned that, we modified the whole system, and by the time we built the second production unit, it was all fixed up. So now we can build a unit here. Uh, we designed one for San Miguel de Allende in Mexico, and has a lot more open space on the top so we can get good ventilation but also very careful uh, ceiling on the bottom and, and, and so on so that we don't have to be worrying about what, what's going to happen. In some cases we have to put double mesh, uh, wire mesh because like the raccoons will jank out a regular chicken wire um, but won't do much with the wire mesh because they can't get their fingers in because the, the squares are smaller and also they don't climb 
uh, they, they do most of their damage on the bottom. So that's where we concentrated all the attention. We came up with all kinds of strategies. And if, if you got the money, well, then you put a cement pad like this and you put a cement bottom and, and that's it. But a lot of people are not gonna have that kind of resource. So we figured there's many other ways we can protect that, right? Uh, that building. The uh, egg laying unit, so I talked to you a little bit about the uh, broilers, right? So that's pretty much, unless you have questions, is, is pretty much all there is to it. You know, forages, canopy, building, two paddocks, rotating back and forth. The rotation, the rotation is determined by the regeneration capacity of that space, which is determined by the shade, temperature of the soil, species of forages we put in there, and rain. That's pretty much all of it. And that's no different for the egg layers, with the different difference that broilers are going to come in as little chicks. You're going to raise them. And they're, by the time they reach adulthood and they are fully grown, they go out because you harvest them. And so you start over again with small chicks. And that cycle puts a very different kind of pressure on the space outside. Meanwhile, the egg layer, you bring it in as a chick. It grows to be an adult, start laying eggs and then stays as an adult for up to 560 days. So the pressure that it puts out in the paddocks is very, very different than the broiler because there is no rest, so to speak. The chickens are going out every day as adults rather than going out as adults for a week like the broiler and then starting all over with little chicks again, which has very little impact and pressure on that space. So the space outside for the, for the egg layers is, is no uh, is five square meters, um, so what is this, like uh, 125 uh, square feet per hand, uh, because again, that pressure is going to be higher. But in that space, under the canopy, we, the, we, it also allows for a lot of critters to continue to reproduce, crickets and all of that, and all this that come from outside and become food for the chickens. And so they control a lot of those bugs, but also allows us to spread grain sprouted and there is enough forage for them to eat so that they don't have we don't have to be putting in uh, uh, regular ground up feed inside the building now inside the building we may put some but it's going to be very specific so maybe a little bit more protein if we see any imbalances there maybe more calcium if you see the shells getting any any weaker and definitely um, supplements so the the, the micronutrients uh, minerals and so on and those are listed in the, in the, in the poultry um, feeding profiles. And if you buy the nucleus, it has all of those minerals in it. And then just mixing them with a little bit of protein and they will eat it up because they also need that. So they, they, uh, they tend to, to grab them. Um, scratch, I don't know if you ever use that, um, um, uh, the shells and all of that. That will give them most of the minerals that they need too if you have access to that. Uh, we can also bring forages from outside and grind them up and then put them into the feeders inside to get them more of that biomass quick, but it's very minimal, just to supplement the, what they, they may not be able to get out of the fields. So that's, those are the only two major differences in between um, uh, the broilers and the hens. In the building, we are looking at a long building again with the difference that if you're gonna do a full unit with 4,000 or 2,000 hens in this kind of weather, uh, in Minnesota, we're doing 4,000. So you're going to have the building. Instead of this way, you're going to have it down the paddock. And then the, the paddocks are going to be divided. I mean, the, the, the 2,000 hands are going to be divided into two paddocks. One on the right-hand side of the building and one on the left side of the building. So it's like this building, wide. And in the center, we're going to have the egg collection system, automatic collection system. Whether you crank it by hand and you put, you know, whatever uh, we used to we made one of these belts with um, um, with those uh, gunny socks um, they are very strong you sew them together and you can and you put a roller at the end a roller at the end and you put a, a handle on it you can actually convey the belts by hand to you the key is to avoid work and collecting eggs in the chicken coop it's a lot of work I don't want to be doing that so we put the egg collection system in the middle this flock over here accesses the, the, the nest from this side, lays their eggs, and this one does it from this side, lays their eggs, and we collect them through the center, just like an industrial system does. And then this flock here has two paddocks on this side, and this 
flock here has two paddocks on this side and we give them up to 125 square feet per hand on each paddock and now you got a massive edible forest and you never have to weed and you never have to fertilize because they do that for you. If I could show you the pictures, you will see what it looks like in Minnesota at the end of the season. There is no weeds there, but if you dig just a little bit under the, 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 the cover of organic matter, there's all kinds of things just waiting to pop right through that organic matter. And the minute we move the chickens to the other side, within two days, the whole thing looks green again because it's right there. They don't never decimate it. <coughs> and we're always putting grain um, back into the paddock continuously. It's not like something you do it once in a while. That's something you do every other day because they, the, the, the grain will sprout and then they will eat it. You don't want the grain growing too much because the sprout, the grain, for three days after it sprouts, it triples the protein content. It absorbs a tremendous amount of minerals, especially if it's sprouted in the ground, to the point that we watch phosphorus, calcium, and iron. Iron went from 28 parts per million to 2,800 parts per million. I mean, if you really, if you took that in the supplement and you put that much iron in the supplement, those chickens will be pooping nails because it, and it killed them because it's too much. And yet in that biological form, in the form of a sprout, they actually grew, um, they, they changed the color of their feathers because I don't know if you know this about birds, but they actually process, their biopathways are such that they process all of the heavy uh, um, elements and put them into the feathers. In fact, the uh, pigeons, this, I learned this from the research that they did on pigeons in New York because the pigeons in the city were darker than the pigeons in the countryside and they took samples and they f figured out that they could put all of that extra pollution into the feathers. And so that's what the chicken was doing except for, for our case, they shedded water a lot easier. They were outside a lot longer. They didn't have the same problems that they had before we started putting the sprouts in lost all of the issues with legs. Sometimes they would get cramped up and stuff. All of those issues went away uh, once we started sprouting the grain. So, so just to give you just tidbits uh, so you get the idea. Uh, I'm not intending here to give you everything just so that you can see how nature works in this case and start making your own decisions about where you are. And if you need help, you can write to me and I'll help you, you know, if, if you need research methodology primarily because uh, almost every ecology has been mapped out. So, so I could go into any place right now and gather local data very quickly and figure out what species grow there, how they grow, and which ones are nitrogen you know, suckers, which ones are economically viable, which ones are nuts, fruits, and so on. Uh, but if you need help with that, um, there is, there is uh, potential for helping with that. Okay, so I um, uh, can't show you this, but if you've got any any way of looking at this what this picture is showing is all of the canopies for the rainforest where i actually put the um the forages on the bottom the bananas and the avocados and i did that because that's how i grew up when i was telling you about how we got out of poverty through poultry chickens and all of that that's the system we, i grew up with all i did was bring science and technology into the original indigenous approach that we had growing up and made it into something that we can now scale, organize as a business, and redo whole industries. Like in the case of Belize, I got the numbers for you so, so that we can look into that. And this is the piñuela that I was telling you about. Uh, if you want the PowerPoint, uh, it's got a copy. In fact, if you want a copy, it's right here. And you will see what the piñuela looks like if you want to look it up. Um, the uh, process. You know, we, we bring the chicks in at a day old. Then we keep them for up to four weeks inside the building. We don't let them out. We open up the building and in this climate, you can open up the building right off, off the track because there's no cold drafts or anything that's gonna kill them. Uh, and then we sustain them with ground up feed during that stage, of course, um, for up to uh, four weeks. After four weeks, uh, during that time also, we are managing the outdoors. So we are making sure that if, um, in this case, you probably just had a flock that left, so there's probably not gonna be a lot of overgrown stuff. In Minnesota, uh, it warms up in the spring and then all the weeds come up. So we normally have to like go and mow once 
you know, with a regular mower, it takes about half an hour to mow a unit. But we normally have to do that so the weeds won't go above the reach of the chickens because then they won't eat them because uh, they are too tall. So we want that, that uh, forage really low to the ground. And when we mow, we will put some organic matter on the trunk of the perennial crops and that helps too. But then we do that in the spring, then the chickens come out and then the next flock just kind of ties to the previous one and the weeds don't take off anymore. Um, but so that's four weeks since they arrive. And then they start roaming outside. Um, in the case of broilers, uh, because we have improved varieties of broilers, uh, if you feed them indoors, they won't never go outside. They will stay by the food and then you're just gonna be growing. You're gonna be growing confinement chickens with all of this stuff outside and they'll never go out. The hens, however, they always go out. You don't, you don't have to worry about them. You can feed them inside and they will always roam all day. Um, so we put uh, feed for the broilers, we put it outside and we train them. Uh, after the four weeks indoors, we train them to go outside and to learn that that's where the food is. And then, and then we lure them with grain. So to get them to go into every corner of the paddocks, we put grain paths and that tr attracts them and they just follow that. And then they come back and then forage all the way back. Cows, I mean, people do that with cows sometimes in Minnesota too with the hay bales. They put them in certain places so that they get them to forage. So we learned that from the cattle folks. Um, the um, other difference within the broilers and the hens is that the broilers, they are gonna sleep on the ground no matter what you do. If, if we end up doing heritage breeds in Belize, then we need a purchase for both of them, broilers and egg layers, because they do like to climb and sleep on boards. So for the egg layers, we definitely require the purchase so that they don't sleep in the ground, because in the ground they get injured, they get, you know, they are exposed to, to the, to the ammonia that even though it's not a lot, it's still manure in the ground and they can get infected. Also, if a mouse gets in, it will go under the hands and it will nibble them. And if they get any drop of blood, blood, remember that chickens are dinosaurs. They are the closest modern relative of T-Rex, just in case you need a little bit of trivia. Um, and so they will eat each other alive, they are cannibals. And so we wanna, we manage even that level of detail so we never lose a chicken. Uh, not to diseases, not to injuries like that, and not to stress because they are never cooped up except at night, and at night they're asleep. So they're not pecking on each other, right? So, so that's how that, that works there. Um, I have pictures of corn and sunflowers and all of that so that you could see how it goes. So again, if you want the, the PowerPoint, you'll be able to see how we grew corn uh, with the chickens, no, feed, no fertilizing, no weeding, uh, at least inside the paddocks. Um, this year, for the first time in, in uh, four years that we've been harvesting hazelnuts, we actually got enough seed uh, from the units that we're not just using them for testing. We used to just extract oil and do all kinds of testing and then plant most of them so that we could have more plant material. But we got all of that in the last four years. So this year, we're actually um, uh, selling them by the pound. We can sell a pound of clean hazelnuts in shell, um, vacuum packed, which we do in the barn, um, for about three to four dollars wholesale to stores that then retail them for, for you know, nine up to $11. So this year, for the first time, the unit that I manage, the income from the hazelnuts is twice the income from the chickens. So this is where we got the numbers for Northern Guatemala and for this region where we could actually give away the, the, the eggs. We were speculating what the industry was gonna do and the Guatemalan egg industry is very, very aggressive. It's owned by three families and uh, they will shoot you if, if you compete with them. I mean, they have poisoned the water of some of the producers. They have poisoned the feed. When you start getting big enough that you start to become competition, they do something like that. So we, we found a very, very um, well-designed pathway to, to keep them from doing that to our operations. Uh, I won't go into that because that's, that's the insurgent uh, at work there. Um, we get good at navigating the war and it's not that different with these folks. Um, 
a lot of organic matter that we harvest. So if you if you are trimming the trees, if you got goats or other animals somewhere else in the farm, well then you can trim all of this and feed them. Uh, you can use it for forage. If not, in our case, we just chip everything up and we then move what we call the energy, right, from the paddock. So this includes the wood chipping material, the manure, and then we move it out into larger scale production in alley cropping systems and all of that. So right now, we are bringing the manure into, for every production unit of 1,500 birds that we have, we get three uh, to four flocks a year in Minnesota. We could get four easily in this climate, up to five uh, flocks here. So when we're done with that, we harvest the manure, we mix it with a lot of that biomass that we're getting from the, from the chips, and then we, we use that to build out the nutrition and the organic matter in larger scale um, uh, acreage, upwards of 15 acres per each one of the production units that we are managing. And what happens is that then we eliminate all of the inputs for that area as well, and now we're going grain that is done in alley cropping systems where we put more hazelnuts and more of that canopy. We grow grain, and then we bring that grain back into the, the chickens or use it for food. So if once we start integrating that, we realize that we can go. So you got the chicken production, egg production, you got chicken processing and chicken and egg processing, you got grain production, grain processing, you got nut production and nut processing, and then we start putting all of that together. We got 14 different enterprise sectors that we are now coordinating as a single enterprise unit. And that's all because of the chicken, right? But why? Because we're managing energy. We're not, we're not producing chickens. We are setting up regenerative designs. And the, 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 chicken is, the chicken can't be regenerative by itself. There is no such thing as regenerative pineapple or regenerative cows or regenerative you know, anything. The only thing that can be regenerative is the systems, not the individual product. And that we got wrong. I mean, everybody's it's like just talking about that, but not, not, not really understanding what, what, what they're actually saying in that context. So we want to make sure that maybe we won't be known because uh, we came up with the right definition of regenerative, but you bet we will be known because we made it work. And that's more important to me than having a claim to the name in this case. I did bring you photos of a processing unit for chickens. Um, which we bought in Minnesota, and then we transferred to the native community in Pine Ridge uh, in South Dakota. But that processing unit is identical to the kind of units that we can bring to Belize, to, to Costa Rica, to, you know, we could put a few of them in Belize, a few of them in Northern Guatemala, and we can go from all the way from the farm to a package chicken that bears the tree range label right in the community, and done it under USDA standards because those units, those, pro those processing units have been made, um, I mean, the U.S. has evolved in that small scale processing system now, and we could just bring them over in the boat. I mean, we don't have, maybe somebody here wants to assemble one, uh, but I think at the beginning, we're gonna have to bring one of those so we get the specs and everything. And so that's, that's what I'm planning, uh, or hoping that we can plan with the Ministry of Agriculture that, that, that you know, we have been having conversations about this, and I'm suggesting that we focus on those pivoting you know, connecting points, and then let the farmers do the growing, do the farming and all of that. Uh, let's focus on, on connecting the supply chain instead. Um, okay, so, too bad I can show you that. And I wish, oh, maybe you can see the label. See, this is the Tree Ranch uh, brand. We incorporated it, we trademarked it, all of that, and we are now turning it into a trust so that anyone in the world who wants to raise their chickens this way and wants to put them under the same label can do that without having ever, ever to pay anything for it. You know. The idea for us is more valuable to create a consolidated global movement behind regenerative poultry than to get into it and start making money right away. This does make money, but if we went that direction, we probably wouldn't go beyond Minnesota because that's all we need to make money on this poultry system. And I wouldn't be here and we wouldn't do any of this. But if we put the label into a, a commons platform with a trust instead, and so everybody can own it, not only do we get to change the poultry system, 
I may not make money, but we get to change the poultry system at a much bigger scale. And we get to create a uniformed global labeling system that reflects the design. That to me is more powerful than almost anything we can do with money. And hopefully, you know, the, the folks who are throwing money at sustainability projects and stuff will look and say, all right, maybe, maybe we can help you retire um, eventually. <laughs> but we'll see if that happens. The, um, I did a profile for Belize just so we can land this on some, some uh, more serious platform. We have, in average, in Belize, according to the Belize Poultry, Belizean Poultry Board, I don't know if you know you have that institution here, but it's, it's pretty well established, got good statistics, and according to them, Belizeans consume 110 pounds of chicken a year in average, which is actually just uh, above the U.S. average in Mexico's and Canada, so we're not different in that way. Um, about 156 eggs per year, which is very low compared to 250 in the U.S. and Canada. And I was, I was told that by folks at the ministry that it's probably because they just, they're not available as easily, more than about people not wanting to eat more eggs. But if you look at that, the retail value of chicken is $2.65 roughly per pound for, um, for meat and around three seventy-five dollars for a dozen eggs. So if you multiply that by the total consumption, we consume in Belize about 42.6 million um, um, uh, pounds of chicken and about uh, 5 million dozen eggs. Together, they add up to $131.6 million worth of economic, as an economic sector. Now, just for reference, $136 million of poultry maybe is the daily sales of a single company mid-size in the United States. So in, 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 at scale, the scale is, I mean, Belize's whole poultry sector is a tiny speck of a single company in a country like the U.S. But, but the reason I say that is not to diminish anything, it's just to, to expose the massive level of opportunity that we have because it's so underdeveloped that we can start by doing it regeneratively almost from the beginning because there is virtually no real poultry industry in, in, in Belize. There is one producer of um, um, uh, egg uh, laying chicks and there is only six producers of uh, broilers, for example. So that's uh, when we got more, more, more than those in Minnesota alone. Uh, so that's just to give you an idea of, of how that's um, structured and the, and the opportunity that we have there to move forward. If we went regenerative in Belize, we have to concentrate on heritage breeds. And to do that, we have to map the heritage breeds. We have to bring them to a place where we can clean them up, so to speak, genetically, and then set up a, a reproduction and, and distribution center so that we can repopulate the landscape with good quality heritage breeds. And maybe in the process, we import some new ones from another place. But we can't start by importing breeds. That, that will decimate the, the, the wealth of, of biological and genetic wealth that we already have in the country. Um, the, um, what I was calculating here is that if we were to do a regenerative poultry system for Belize, uh, at the numbers I, 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 I described to you before, um, and using only 150 egg layers per production unit and 250 um, broilers, per production unit, we can get each production unit, you know, at 150, and 60% efficiency only, considering that this, these egg layers are very efficient energy transformers, but they are not very efficient egg layers, and that's why they are efficient in energy, because they don't waste themselves laying eggs every single day. That's actually not good for a, an operation that wants to be very profitable in the context of income versus expenses, right? Yeah, more eggs, but you get so much more expenses that the extra production of eggs just shoots you in the foot, right? So looked at it that way, every single production unit, if we put one farmer per production unit, or one production unit per farmer, we'll need about 1,837 farmers only to get 100% of total egg consumption in Belize fully regenerative. That's a very tiny 
amount of farmers. Uh, for the broilers, it's a little bit more. We we'll produce up to 750 broilers a year at that level of production per unit. Um, and it will take about 15,100 farmers at one production unit each. But these are very small things. The key is to think small in terms of each farmer, but very large in terms of networking them. So we can deploy the processing parks, facilities, and that kind of stuff in a centralized place, and even the supply of some of those supplements, even the storage and collection of grain, so that the grain producers can be contracted on the systemic approach. All of that, I laid it all out so that if we want to do this in Belize, we got the full system blueprint all the way to 100% of all the chicken and all of the eggs in the country. And it's a very small enterprise. Actually, the, the, the Peace Coffee company I ran in Minnesota was bigger than this company would be. And that was when I was, before I went to ag, I mean, uh, business school. So this would be a very doable, uh, very attainable uh, goal for Belize. And just to give you um, a sense of um, what else would, would, would come along, you know, in terms of the impact, ecologically we get to put back all of those species and we get to value them again so farmers start to see the value of putting forests back into a space because there is literally there is money to be made there and food to be had for the families. Um, economically we're talking about 131.6 million dollars and um, potentially turning Belize as, a, as an international brand of regenerative poultry because nobody else can really do this at a country scale. Belize can do it because it's so small. No other country is ever going to be able to do a full country overhaul like Belize can. You miss that. If we miss that in Belize, there is no turning back because eventually somebody else is going to do it and there is only one chance to do a first impression, as you know. There is no second chance for that. So I'm, I'm excited that we could potentially do this and it wouldn't take those many farmers. That's the most interesting thing. I mean, probably in the room here, we got half of the land that we need. Uh, if we mapped it out. And then socially, we're talking about 17,000 small farmers. And coordinating 17,000 small farmers isn't really rocket science. Uh, one single co-op in Guatemala has 23,000 small farmer members. And is, uh, he was already there when I was working in Guatemala in 1992, and it's even stronger now. Those blueprints are all over the place. It's totally doable at that scale. Um, and so, I don't know. I mean, I wish you could see this because this is what I would deliver if Belize wants to do this. I got the full system mapped out all the way from policies that need to be in place, international agreements that have to be in place, uh, certification systems and verification systems that have to be in place with criteria, with principles, criteria, indicators, and verifiers already mapped out all the way to the blueprint for every unit and all of the layers of economic activity, value added, infrastructure, budgets for the processing facilities, the layout on how you set up a budget for a farm with 150 unit uh, hands, all of that is laid out in curriculum, ready to be deployed the minute people decide they wanna go forward with it. That's what I said at the beginning. I wanna to talk to people who wanna do things because uh, I'm not really, that good of a talking head. I am an entrepreneur and I would like to to go forward with that spirit. So I hope that fulfills your objectives for today and that you get as excited as I do about this. <laughs>